Attends, moi, du coup. Euh... Hello everybody and welcome to St. John's. It's lovely to see so many people here. I have to admit the world is a bit apprehensive because this is a new adventure for us and we really want people to get, get something out of it. Certainly an awful lot has been put into it. And it's my pleasure to introduce, I probably go down to this anymore, um, to introduce uh, Andrew to uh, set the series off. He's going to give an introduction so that we know what we're about and all the um, trimmings that go with these talks. So, without any more ado, welcome. About November last year, I was asked to give a talk at um, St John's. And they said to me, um, come, and, come and give a talk, because, and talk on, on whatever you like, because the people who are here don't understand much about what Christianity is about. And that, that very statement, I think, is actually quite true of the society we're living in at the moment. We often assume that people understand what Christianity is at its core. But many of the things that they hear about in the press or when they're thinking about what church business is doesn't seem to relate to the very essence of what Christianity is. And so this course is trying to say, if you're trying to define what is at the heart of Christianity, what would you give someone? What are the messages that you would try to set out before them. So in this course, we are looking at eight different aspects of the core of Christianity. And we start off with what I think is probably at the center. So we'll start off with a quote that you probably all know quite well. In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what is the Word? What's the Word that's key? To try and find out, I'd like to ask you a question. If you look back over the 20th century, what is the most significant invention that happened in the 20th century? What would it be? You see, when I considered that, I thought, well, actually, I may not like having to admit it, but probably the most significant invention in the 20th century was the mobile phone. The mobile phone has revolutionized the way we live. Not just in this country, around the whole world. I went to Africa. And what happens in Africa? The, all the phones got trashed by the walls. But they use the mobile phone. Mobile phones are everywhere. Mobile phones allow people to connect with other people without being in a certain place. Without having set a time that they're going to communicate. Just tap in a number and send off the message. So it allows us to see things that we otherwise wouldn't ever be able to see before. What is it? What is the message that somebody would give to you if they are in the very last moments of their life? Can you put the washing in? No, probably not. Have you cleaned your shoes? No. What is it? What evidence have we got? Well, you may remember the disaster of 9-11. The mobile phone came to, into its own on that day for me. We found out what the message was that people want to share at the extremity of their life. What is it? Three words. I love 
you. I love you. That's what people want to say. The word. What is the word? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. I suspect that the word is love. And John's Gospel, John really does major in on this. God is love. So, that's where we are. We know what people say in the extremity of life. But do we live that in our life day to day? Answer, no. No. We have lots of other things, lots of other measures that we place upon us that we say this is our value system. We value what we make, what we do, the position we are, the money we earn. But do we value love? Do we, have we got the guts to say that my faith belief means that love is of the most paramount importance in my life. I suspect that few of us have got the guts to do that until we're faced with a significant death. When somebody dies in your life that you know and love and has been a major part of that life, of your life, when they die, you reassess. And at that point, you make a discovery that the people you go to their funerals are the people that have loved you and you love them. Love is the ultimate value, and we underline it every time we hit that last moment. One of my friends once upon a time said to me, my father's death was the greatest gift he'd ever given me. Why? Not because of his inheritance, but because that very act of dying made him realise that love was the most significant thing in his life. And from that moment, his life changed. The value system changed. The significance of love comes into our life and then starts to change us. We then start to see life in a very different way. And that happens in almost every single thing that we do. We can be sitting in a concert and suddenly be moved to tears. I was watching a rugby match when that happened. Why? Because love had touched my heart and it made me aware of what was significant. It reminded me of someone who was so close to me that he was most precious. You can't go into an art gallery and look at the pictures in the same way. You can't go into a church and just think, oh, it's just a building. Everything changes once you've made that discovery that love is everything. Because what happens is that you start to see life in a different way. You start to see the experience of life is wrapped up in the words. And that a word brings back a memory. And so the word is no longer defined by what you read in the dictionary. It's related to the events of your life which key into that word. 
because of the loving connections that you have with that word and the events that have happened in your life. So words become much more than just a way to convey history. They start to convey experience. They are the conduits for our experience in life. So, should it be surprising to us that when Jesus was at his last moment of his life, and he recognised that actually this could be the end of my time with you, where does he turn the conversation? Does he rail at people that have done him wrong? Does he tell Peter to stop being so stupid? Does he complain about the food that's set before them? No. He talks about love. He talks about love. He spent three years of his life trying to show people what life is like, has the potential for being like, when you live it in communion with God. He's tried to give them an understanding of love by walking every day with them. He's wanting to give them what I call the lens of love so that they can see the meaning of life more clearly. But they could say, well, what is love? What is love? Has he defined love? In words? No. In actions? Yes. In experience? Yes. He's given them loads and loads of examples of experience to show them this is love. This is what I mean by living in God's love. And they remembered. That's why we've got the Gospels. They remembered. So he gave them the final command. What should you do to know what love is? Love one another as I have loved you. Simple. He hasn't defined it. He says, go back to the experiences you've had with me and you'll know what love is. Because everything I've done with you over the last three years has been, in essence, what I know of my father and I've lived out in love. The trouble is that our memories play tricks. And what our memories do is we tend to exaggerate the past. We can make it really awful or we can see it with rose-tinted spectacles. Jesus isn't saying that. He's saying, love in what you have experienced, in the reality of what you've experienced. Don't rewrite history. Don't try and gloss over the nasty bits. Love is in the reality of the life that we have shared. You see, when we try to rewrite history and we try to make it all nice and comfortable, then actually what we're doing is devaluing love. What we're doing is we're saying, well, I like ice cream. And so love has got to be the mega liking of ice cream. And Jesus is saying, it's not. Love is far, far greater than that. Love is 
enabling you to take the reality of life and transform it into something beautiful. So liking may be where you start, but loving is far ri richer. And it is only when you acknowledge the imperfections that you start to w work into the reality of love. So when dear old Peter gets it wrong time and time again, should those be written out of the script? No! Should we look at the disciples and say, well, they were perfect people? Rubbish! They were like us. Full of imperfections. And it is the imperfections that enable us to discover what love is. That's odd. So you mean to say we can be real? Yes. That's the discovery of love. To be totally real. To be yourself as God made you. When we move out of the zone where we're just presenting a fake person into a zone where we're creating, where we are our reality, we become very vulnerable. What Jesus showed us on the cross is don't stop there. Be vulnerable. Be yourself. Because in, only in that way will you know the love of God in its entirety. Love is not about partial acceptance. It's not about being good. It's about being real. It's about letting God into the situation where you are so that that, trans that transformation through love can occur. So love is only real when we accept reality. So the definition of love that the Christian heritage carries is far greater than the definition that our society likes to promote. Our society knows the importance of love, but it's trying to redefine it in a nice, cosy way. What it's trying to do is it's trying to say romantic and sexual love, yes, we understand that. I'm not sure the church understands sexual love, but we won't go there. But what Christianity is offering is an understanding of love which is far richer than romantic, sexual, or any other type of love that you have met. It is all embracing. It is the totality of our being. So why should we do this? Because it's so costly. It means that we've got to expose ourselves in our entirety of our reality, of our being. We've got to take risks. Why should we do it? Why? Because life becomes beautiful. You meet people at a much richer and deeper level. But, in the process, you become in contact with God. That's the purpose of prayer. To bring you deeper and deeper and deeper into that contact with God. So that you may know love in all its fullness. St. John says, God is love. And those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. I think those are some of the truest words in the Bible. What Jesus is trying to do is to take us from the where we are into God's kingdom. He wants us to know what it's like 
to live in the hands of God. To live with that richness of being in God's kingdom. He wanted his disciples to know the power of God for themselves. But not in just the special circumstances of life, but in all aspects of life, in the everyday. Because he knew that by doing so, society will be transformed. What St. Mark tries to do in his Gospel is show us how when this attitude to life is taken on, the world around us is transformed. If you look at St. Mark's Gospel, the first part of the Gospel is all about bringing the people who have been pushed out of society, bring them back in, making them at one with society, accepting, renewing, enlivening, opening eyes. Everyone is able to come in and be fully themselves. But all Gospels say this is difficult. St. Mark shows the difficulty by showing how the disciples keep on missing the point. They keep on misunderstanding. There's always this scratching of the head, well, you're the Messiah, but you can't do that. No, 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 that shouldn't happen to you. Wrong again, Peter. It's, it's impossible for us to, to make this jump from the material world into God's world and to say we're going to sustain it. We have to... You have nothing to fear about death. Because we're going from God's kingdom in this world to God's kingdom in your death. Now, I've seen some people who have died and it is as though to share with you is the message of love. And that when we go into the depth of love of the Christianity offers, we have got the power to transform the world around us. And not only can we transform the world around us, but we actually transform the way we live our life and we, the way we see our death. message on. I 
then come back. But not only come back, but you bring others. Please bring others. Because I've read some of the talks. And I can honestly say that some of them are the best thing that I've ever read from those people. Because they've got the essence of what this is all about. That's the end of the talk section. I'm open to questions now, and if you want to ask a question, 